the last several classes we've looked at <clears throat> how to tell the difference between these and um, what makes an inductive argument an inductive argument, what makes a deductive argument a deductive argument. Uh, we've talked about concepts like strength and validity and soundness and um, uh, cogency. Um, let's see, Perry. Um, but we haven't introduced this other issue um, with it. We've talked about implicit or unstated premises for arguments, right? Sometimes when you're making an argument, you don't spell the entire thing out. And that can be a problem when you're trying to figure out, am I dealing with a deductive argument or an inductive argument? Because remember, how do you tell? You have to look at what is the connection between the premises and the conclusion. And you're not looking at whether the premises are actually true yet or whether the conclusion is true. You're sort of imagining a hypothetical world in which the premises, if they were true, what would happen? Um, and to what degree would it follow? If you can say, well, if, these, if the person who's making the argument is presenting it to you as if, well, if these premises are true, that conclusion has to follow, then you're dealing with a deductive argument, right? If they're doing it <clears throat> and they're, they're hedging their bets, they're, they're, <clears throat> excuse me, they're qualifying it, they're making it less strong, and they're saying, well, it probably follows, then we're dealing with an inductive <coughs> argument. So this is familiar ground to, to most of you by now. Now, what do you do if somebody just makes an assertion like, like this, for example? Um, somebody asked me about the Super Bowl. Um, and maybe they say something like this. The Packers won. I bet you're happy. Right? Now, what are they assuming? Say again? Packers. That I'm a Packers fan. So there's one implicit assumption there right now. So let's, let's add that. Um, you are a Packers fan. Does that get us here yet? No, there's still some more things that would have to be spelled out. So let's move this down. And, oh boy. That's not good. Um, I bet you're. Happy. There's something else that has to be assumed there. How do you get from the Packers won and you're a Packers fan, which are um, statements of fact, right? They're, if yeah. you watch football. Uh, that could be another assumption that still wouldn't get you here, though. You can, you can bring in all sorts of other extraneous considerations. Um, you liked eating chili while you were watching the Packers. Well, that's still not going to get you here. You have to have something. Something like a general rule or a universal rule. When your team wins, you're happy? Very good. That'll work. Um, you're a Packers, the Packers won, you're a Packers fan. When your team wins, you're happy. So notice, to go from here to here, we had to introduce Two more premises. This is the way a lot of your arguments that you make in real life and the arguments that other people are making to you uh, actually work. They have a lot of implicit or unstated premises. Sometimes they actually don't even spell out the conclusion for you. They expect you to figure out what the conclusion is. You know, if it's, if it's evident. You know, think about advertisements. Does every advertisement actually say buy our product? No. But every advertisement is actually oriented towards you making that, that conclusion, isn't it? Um, so the Packers won, you're a Packers fan. Now notice, this one here is different than these two. Like I said, this is a statement of fact, the Packers won. Could be true, could be false. If the Steelers had won, then it would be a false statement. If you said this uh, last year, it would be a false statement, right? Because the Cardinals beat the Packers. I was very disappointed to find that out because, you know, I don't know, 
hard time seeing the, the Cardinals as a real team because they're an expansion team. But um, they, you know, if they lose to the Bears, that's okay because the Bears, you know, have been around since I was a kid. But that's a factual statement. Uh, you're a Packers fan. That's a factual statement too, right? Um, and notice it's about an individual. This is a rule. This is something that's got broader applicability. This is sort of like a hypothetical statement. If you're in these conditions, then this happens. If you're a student, then you have to pay your, your uh, tuition. I don't have to pay tuition, right? That, that if then doesn't apply to me. But that rule does apply to you, doesn't it? Or um, think about traffic laws, you know? Um, I remember back when I was in, in uh, graduate school, some students would come home from the bars um, and they wouldn't drive, but they would ride a bike. <laughs> and the town didn't actually have a law against riding your bike while intoxicated. And eventually they did pass a law because there were too many students who were, you know, running into things because they were drunk. Now, you know, what does the law actually apply to? Only the things that it's written for. A law is a is a sort of rule, and a rule can either be universal, it applies to everything like that, or in, in the case of inductive arguments, the kind of rules that we're going to work with are probability statements. For instance, if you, let's think of some other general rules, let's think about medicine. Um, if you wash your hands frequently, um, you're less likely to get certain diseases, right? <coughs> That's why a lot of people like to wash their hands all the time. Now, if you wash your hands too much, what else can happen? Maybe you become dry. Yeah, you, you get rid of all the oils from your skin, and then that's not good either. Now, there could be some people who could wash their hands all the time, and it doesn't affect them. But that's not the, that's not the rule. When we say, well, the exception doesn't negate the rule, we're talking about inductive arguments. We're talking about inductive uh, reasoning. <clears throat> if we say, well, let's say I see one of you washing your hands all the time. I say, what's going on with you? Well, I don't want to get sick. You know, you're washing your hands 100 times a day. And, you know, most people who wash their hands 100 times a day, their skin gets very dry and it starts to, to split. And that might actually be worse than the getting sick. And then you say, well, I do it all the time. And it doesn't bother me. I said, well, okay, you're the exception. I wasn't talking about a universal rule that applies to everybody. I was giving a general rule, right? Uh, I give general rules like that when I say things to you like, well, you know, if you want to prep for this test, you can't wait until the last minute. Some of you may be able to, right? You could be exceptions to that. I don't know for certain. Uh, there are some, some deductive arguments that have universal rules, right, where we say, well, look, if this is the case, this absolutely has to be the case. This thing follows this, like um, the, old, the old standby, if there's smoke, there's fire. Um, not exactly true, but if there's smoke, there is combustion of some sort. You may not have flames. You don't think so? How else could you have smoke? The heat coming off tires. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, yeah, yeah, no yeah. Tire smoking. Yeah. Um, if we, yeah, if we include that in smoke, that would be an exception to the rule. Um, hmm. I wouldn't bear some thinking about because the logicians always bring up, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire as as a sign, as sort of an infallible sign of the existence of fire. So I guess you could extend it and say, well, you know. There's some sort of process of things breaking down because of heat. Then we can have a universal rule, right? Um, but notice what you'd have to do. You'd have, if you want to make a deductive argument, you know, I see smoke, wherever there's smoke, there's fire, you would have to, uh, well, not fire, there is heat involved breaking down activities or something like that. You would have to change it if you want to make it a good deductive argument, wouldn't you? Now, if you want an inductive argument, um, that works just fine. You don't have to change it. So now this one, let's think about this. When your team wins, you're happy. There's no probably in there, is there? 
So we should, we should interpret this as making a universal claim. Something like, any, anybody whose team wins is happy. That's a universal claim that would apply to everybody. Don't worry whether it's true or not. We're, at this point, we're concerned with, uh, is it a universal claim or a general claim that admits of some exceptions? Um, I bet you're happy. That sounds more like inductive language, doesn't it? If you say, I bet, you're, you're not saying I'm 100% sure, are you? No. Yeah. I mean, some people might be so sure of themselves, whether for good reasons or bad reasons, that when they, when they have an opinion about something, it must be right. Or when they come to a judgment, it absolutely must be right. They, they don't hold out any possibility that they could be mistaken. But most people, when they say, I bet, they're making an inductive argument. So it's really... What we probably want here is when your team wins, you're probably happy, right? And, and this would be a good inductive argument. Now notice, like an iceberg floating you know, in the ocean, you're all familiar with that old saying about icebergs that 90% of the iceberg is below the surface, so you've got to watch out for, for the, you know, the peaks of them, because by the time you're actually close to the peak, you've probably hit the iceberg. Um, arguments are like this very often. We make a lot of assumptions. Uh, let's, let's take another one, uh, a non-football related one. Um, let's use things from student life. Um, give me any, any sort of fact about students, or even a student, that you can think of. And we'll go some more. Study. Student study. Okay. And let's say, um, well, you remember we talked about this at the beginning of the semester, um, this idea that, well, if you go to college, you're writing your ticket for success in life, um, prevalent uh, I'd call it a misconception, because it's not really based on sufficient evidence anymore. But, let's say you have that in your mind, and you're, you're uh, talking to one of your friends, and uh, they're a student. Let's say they don't actually study, though. You're trying to make a case for why they ought to study. Um, so let's say college graduates. are usually successful in life. Right? There could be some that aren't. Um, I have a few friends who graduated, who I graduated from college with, who were not particularly successful in life. Uh, you know, they have one problem or another. Matter of fact, a lot of the people who I graduated with from graduate school are still looking for full-time jobs. Some of them 10 years out. Well, how do you get from student study to college graduates are usually successful? Um, you have to be assuming a lot of things to get from point A to, not point B, maybe point C, point D, point E, right? Um, Successful. That's good. When students study, they, how about let's say they tend to be successful. That works. Actually, that will get us here. So we didn't have to do... You, I was actually anticipating we'd have to do, you know, five or six different steps to get there. Well, if they study, then they're probably going to pass tests, and if they pass tests, they'll get through their classes, and if they get through their classes, they'll get a college degree, and if they have the college degree, then they're a college graduate. But this actually gets us right there. When students study, they tend to be successful. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, we probably would have to put in something there about them graduating. 
but let's just go with this for the time being. Now notice, again, this is a general rule. It's not a universal rule. It's not saying that every student who studies is going to be successful. There's right and wrong ways to study. Um, you know, I, I remember my sister when she uh, was in high school um, laying in front of the TV with, with the textbooks and saying, I'm studying. And, you know, yeah, she was studying the shows. She was studying what was going on, but if you asked her anything about the material, eh, it wasn't really sticking with her. So there, there's, you know, you could study something that you call studying, but, but not do that well with it, right? You all, you all know some people like that. I'm going to study, I'm going to put it under my pillow, and the, the facts will just sort of leach their way into my brain. That's not studying either, is it? You've done? You, it's worked? The, the knowledge somehow seeped out of the book and into your, into your brain? I disagree with that, it'll get you there. You disagree with what? But that'll get you there, because I think that's still too open in general. Like, successful with what? I think oh, the, yeah, the we're, final statements. Too. Yeah, at this point we're not worried about that. We're, we're just looking at the, the, uh, the logic of it. Yeah, you could, you could say we need to clarify what you mean by successful. Um, but you notice, you know, it's left pretty open and vague here. So if it's if it's open and vague in the conclusion, it's open and vague in the, the premises. It might be okay. Although um, that does bring up a good point. There is a fallacy that we're going to look at later on in the semester called the fallacy of equivocation. And when you equivocate, you're using a term that's vague or ambiguous. Um, in more than one way when you're making an argument about something. What's your last name? Last name, okay. Um, so yeah, you, I mean, that could be a, an issue. You could say, here's a good example. There, there are many college students who are successful academically and they get out and they get good jobs, so that's a kind of success, right? Actually, two kinds of success. And then their marriages fall apart, their kids hate them, uh, they die bitter, empty, and alone. That's not being successful. That's a different... Now, they're successful in one way, but they're not successful in another way. That's because successful is it's an a ambiguous term. It can mean a lot of different things. It can also be a vague term. Where with vague terms, it's hard to say sometimes what, you know, where the dividing lines are. I mean, you could point at, say, Steve Jobs of Apple. He's pretty successful. Um, and you could point, who's somebody who could, you could say is definitely not successful? Um, anybody you can think of? Celebrity? Yeah. Tommy Tommy Tommy. MC Hammer. He's, uh, yeah, he's, he's an interesting guy. Let's say we take MC Hammer from uh, 10 years ago, before he had his act together, and he was deep in debt and was having to sell off all his property. Let's say that he was unsuccessful, after being successful. <clears throat> Those are easy cases to decide, right? And then there's other cases that are kind of in the, in the middle, and they're, they're harder to figure out. That means that they're vague. So successful could be a vague term, or it could be an ambiguous term, where it could be interpreted more than one way. Now, let's say we take some, some other arguments. I want to show you something else about these um, implicit premises and rules. Let's say we take our, our old standby. Um, oh, I won't put that in yet. Um, it's snowing today. Therefore, class is canceled. Snowy tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I heard that we may have a snow day tomorrow. That, that could be kind of nice. Unfortunately, I don't have any classes tomorrow, just a meeting that I actually really need to be at uh, since I'm coordinating it. So, uh, snow days are fun, aren't they? Okay, so it's snowing today. What have we, what have we used over and over again? To, to get us from this point to here, a sort of if-then statement or whenever statement. 
if it snows, class will be canceled. Yeah. And we usually index it to Fayetteville, right? Because mm -hmm. if it's if it's snowing um, in Indiana, class isn't canceled necessarily. So um, let's let's instead of using F, just to make it a little bit clearer, let's use whenever. <coughs> Whenever it snows in Fayetteville, class is canceled. Okay, now this is what we call a universal rule. That's, there's no exceptions to it. We're saying whenever, any anytime that it happens, we're not leaving ourselves any wiggle room. This is a this whole argument here is deductive, isn't it? Because if these premises are true, that conclusion, the person is saying, if these premises are true, that conclusion has to be true. There's no, well, maybe, or possibly, or probably, or anything like that. Um, what if somebody points out to you, well, there have been cases where it snowed in Fayetteville, and classes weren't canceled. Now, what do you do in an argument, typically? You back up a little bit, don't you? Right? You say, well, yeah, I, I understand that. Um, I wasn't talking about every single time as if I'm God and know the in, you know, intimate construction of the universe and, and everything. I'm just making a general statement. I'm just talking about what usually or probably or likely happens. Um, so, then you say something more like, okay, it's snowing today. That's, that stays the same. Uh, and you do say also class is canceled. What changes when you go from a deductive to an inductive argument? It's the rule. It's the strength of the rule that you're using. You change it from a universal rule to a general rule, and you say, usually, or probably, or most times. Usually, when it snows in Fayetteville, class is canceled. So, let me put a star next to the, these premises. Universal rule, general rule. Notice, neither one of these was actually above board, something that you spelled out for your audience at the start. So when, when somebody makes a claim to you like, well, you know, it's snowing, we're not going to have class, you have to figure out, are they making an inductive argument or a deductive argument? Are they trying to say, um, because of these premises, I know for certain that this claim is true. Or are they making a inductive argument saying, well, it's probably true. And you notice that when I brought this up, you were all sort of familiar with this idea of backing off from an argument that you've made that's a little bit too strong. Because you've done that many times. And people around you have done that many times. This is part of human communication. We tend to make claims a little bit stronger than, than we actually have evidence for. And then in conversation, somebody points this out to us, and then we, we back off and we come to the, the more appropriate degree of evidence. There's a lot of things that we think we know for certain that yeah, really we don't. We can't be 100% sure, right? But that doesn't mean that you can't be 98% sure or 70% sure. Just because you don't know something 100% doesn't mean you don't know it. Uh, some people will actually use that as part of an argument to try to manipulate you. Say, so, well, you know, you don't know for sure that he's a bad guy, so I think you should invest your money with him. You haven't proven that he's a crook. He's never been convicted. Yeah, sure, he's been accused, but lots of people have been accused. Therefore, um, you should trust him. Uh, 
No, you're, you're, if, if you have good evidence for thinking that something is probably the case, if you have some sort of useful general rule, like in this case, <clears throat> in Fayetteville, usually when it does snow, class is canceled, right? In your experience? Not, not every time necessarily, but usually. So if I were to make a bet with you about tomorrow, you know, uh, we bet a, a dollar or you know, ten dollars or whatever, um, you would you would want to bet on once it starts snowing. You would want to bet on classes cancel, and that would be a good bet. You wouldn't bet on the other side. That's sort of like going to the casino and putting your money when the roulette wheel spins instead of putting it on red or black, putting it on the one little green spot in there. Which some people do. Sometimes somebody wins, but it's pretty rare. Um, so, deductive arguments, uh, universal rule, inductive arguments, general rule. Um, I'll give you another example of this. Uh, one that we've looked at a number of times in this class. Think about when people are stereotyping. I, I used that as an example before for um, implicit premises. If somebody says, um, who do you want to pick on today? What, it doesn't have to be a race, it could be a profession, it could be age, it could be anything you like. What group do you want to pick on today? The IRS. The IRS? Because yeah. <laughs> it's tax season, right? Yeah, I hate them right Yeah, I, I can understand that feeling. Um, the older you get, the, the more you dislike the IRS. Yeah. Okay, so how about IRS, um, IRS agents, maybe? Um, what's, what's something that you might say about them? Then? Well, it's not typically them, it's just the whole system. I IRS policy. Okay, IRS policy, but we want to, I, I want to use this for stereotyping. So we can, we can make it as... Um, and they're aggressive towards you. Okay, they're aggressive. They're thieves. They're thieves. Okay, that's even better. Because we want something. I, I want to use this to illustrate stereotyping. So we want something that isn't actually true. Um, and we'll use the aggressiveness, and we'll, we'll tie that somehow to to thieves. So um, IRS agents are thieves. Um, IRS agents are aggressive people. are aggressive people with too much power. That's the kind of people the IRS hires. And we're going to try to get to an all statement down here. They're all thieves. So you meet an IRS, you meet somebody at a party, you know, their, uh, their husband or their wife introduces them to you, you know, meet, meet so and so. Well, what do you do for a living? I'm an IRS agent. Oh, you're a thief. <laughs> right? Um, how do you get there from, from here? We need some sort of universal rule because we're working with a deductive argument, um, we need some sort of universal rule that's going to get from them being aggressive people with too much power to being thieves. All aggressive, all aggressive people, yeah, that'll work. Um, all aggressive people with too much power steal. Now, notice that we still have to assume one more thing, a definition. Um, people who steal are thieves. And, so we have um, two implicit premises here, two unstated premises. Um, so you're at the party, and uh, you meet this person, you say, well, you're a thief. And they say, why would you say something hurtful like that? 
And then you say, well, all our IRS agents are thieves. And I say, how do you know that? And you say, well, all you IRS agents are aggressive people with too much power. And I say, well, that doesn't get you to us being thieves. And you say, yeah, sure it does. Aggressive people with too much power steal. People who steal are thieves. Therefore, you're a thief, right? And there, and there the, the party's pretty much over for, for you guys. Um, or the hostess asks you to leave or something like that. Um, or maybe, you, you know, you reconcile afterwards. Now notice some stereotyping is going on. And what's going on with the stereotyping? These assumptions that are sort of being carried with people. Um, this is a good one. People who steal are thieves. That's a definition. No need to revise that one, is there? Um, I mean, you could quibble and say, well, what if somebody is taking bread for their hungry children and they have no other way of, of uh, providing for them? And, you know, actually, there, there's a philosopher, uh, Thomas Aquinas, who considers that case, and he says, well, then they're not stealing. It's a different kind of act. You have to re-describe it, you know. You have to pick the best definition of the, of the act. Um, well, let's put that aside. So there's no problem with this. Um, I mean, if you, if you get the dictionary out and you look up thief, I'm sure it's got stealing in there somewhere. This one, all IRS agents are aggressive people with too much power. Um, the odds of that being true as an all or nothing statement, you know, a universal statement, are probably pretty low. I'll bet you you can find at least one IRS agent who is not um, aggressive and has too much power. I don't know any. Actually, my, my interactions with the IRS have not been pleasant uh, on my part either. Once you get into tax trouble, you know, um, you, it just keeps spiraling because then you have to, um, the, the, the attempts to resolve it take a long time and involve misunderstandings and, and all that. Um, all aggressive people with too much power steal. I don't know. That one, do you think that one's true? All aggressive people with too much power steal? They may do other things. They, you know, there's that old saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. If we assume that something like that is true, then people who are aggressive and have too much power, they're probably going to do something bad. But will it necessarily be stealing? No, they might uh, murder people. Or... What's that? That's worse. That is worse, yeah, but that's different. That's the key thing. That's, that's, we're not saying that they either steal or do something worse. We say they, they steal. So, uh, you, you know, you've presented this to your IRS agent, and they say, that's, a, that's an awful argument. Didn't you go to critical thinking class? And you say, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And I, and I passed it, but I forgot some of these things. Let me uh, reconstruct this. Let me back up a little bit. Um, well, I wasn't saying that all of you IRS agents are people with too much power. I was saying most of you. I wasn't actually saying that all aggressive people with too much power uh, steal. Because some of them murder, and some of them kidnap, and some of them rape, and some of them do, do other things. But most of them do. Right? Yeah. So let's change it from a deductor to an inductor, right? Yes, very good. That's exactly what you're doing. You are changing it from a, a deductive argument to an inductive argument. Now we have to have something uh, like most down here, or probably, or likely, or odds are. We don't have to change this, because this is a definition. Right? We don't have to say, well, uh, most people who steal are thieves. You know, people who steal are, are actually thieves. That's the definition of thief. Um, this may still be a weak argument or a bad argument because uh, not not because the the structure is bad, but are these premises actually true? We, you know, do we know this one? Most IRS agents are aggressive people with too much power. Um, usually when we're stereotyping, we're making assumptions about most or all, and we don't actually have a good evidentiary basis for it. How many IRS agents do, do all of us know? Yeah. I mean, maybe some of us have met a few. Um, and maybe some of us have even met them outside of the IRS context, but, but probably not an awful lot. 
Who knows? Though? Some of you may go to work for the IRS. You know, um, most aggressive people with too much power steal. What do you think about that premise? If we're taking that as a general rule, most people, most aggressive people with too much power steal. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not asking us to reword it. I'm asking, okay. do you think it's true? As a claim, I see a couple people shaking heads. So a couple people nodding heads too. So this would be a controversial premise. Um, could be, could be true. You would actually have to. White collar crime. Yeah, white collar crime. Um, are those? Especially with Bernard, you can get that one. Yeah. Are those necessarily aggressive people? Actually, a lot of white collar criminals are kind of, kind of, yeah, um, aggressive people with too much power. Those tend to be the prisoners that I saw. You know, the murderers. The the, what's that? The aggressive or passive. Yeah. I don't know. This one, this one could be questionable, right? So this is not a very good argument. And usually when we're stereotyping, we're doing things like this. When people know everything about uh, all Muslims, and then they backpedal to, well, most Muslims. Well, you know, there's 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. So unless you're you know, meeting an awful lot of them where you're involved in Muslim communities or you're a scholar of Islam and you actually have looked at some of the demographic studies, you may not have good grounds for those sort of uh, universal rules or, or general rules. Now when it comes to day-to-day -day interactions, do you guys have good grounds for making uh, universal and general rules? Yeah. I mean, by this point in your life, you know something about human nature. You know something about uh, actions and consequences. If you do this, this is probably going to happen. There are some things that you know, you know, inside and out that we don't question. Like if I drop this, what's going to happen? <coughs> it's going to fall. Nobody, nobody thinks it's going to just sort of hang in the air, right? Because you're all making a, an assumption of a universal rule: objects that are dropped, unless something is blocking them, fall. We, you know, we call this somewhat incorrectly the law of gravity. Um, law actually says that two bodies will be attracted to each other according to what? The, the inverse square of their distance? I think that's how it runs. Um, but you know, the basic way of, uh, that we parse it is, well, if you drop something, it's going to fall. That's a universal rule that you can rely on. Um, now, what you're going to do with an argument depends on what you make of those unstated premises. So, you have to figure out when somebody throws out a premise and then throws out a conclusion, you have to figure out, are you dealing with somebody who's making uh, an inductive argument or a deductive argument? Look at the kind of claims that they're making, the kind of assumptions that you think they're making. And one other thing. I'll, I just want to make sure I'm... Okay. The unstated premises are the ones that you have to ask for it by, right? That's the one we're filling in, right? Yes. Filling in the blank. Yes. Um, so like on our test, is this going to be on there? <laughs> Uh, the review sheet has a lot of topics. Okay. I don't tell you precisely which topics are going to be on there. So like if it were, you would just have the top and the bottom. And we'd have or, the I, or I might ask you to find an unstated premise which would make the argument uh, strong or make the argument uh, valid. If it's, if it's asking you for one to make it valid, it's asking you for a... Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's let's look at an example. Um, uh, let's say everybody likes bacon, right? As a matter of fact, even people who aren't supposed to eat pork like 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 bacon usually. You know, uh, there's something about bacon. <laughs> and now you now you know what the, the the culinary rage is chocolate covered bacon. Believe I've never had it. I haven't had it. Yet. <laughs> okay, well, let's let's work with that. Um, we'll, we'll end up with the, the conclusion: chocolate covered bacon. Chocolate covered bacon is disgusting. And let's say we start off with the premise. Um, chocolate and bacon have tastes that do 
not go together. Go to together. Now, if I were to ask you, find a universal rule that makes this into a valid argument, I'm asking you to supply me another premise here that would make it into a good deductive argument. So chocolate and bacon have tastes that don't go together. Whenever, here'd be one, whenever two things have tastes that don't go together, they're, they're disgusting. Or anytime you combine two tastes that don't go together, the result is disgusting. There's more than one way to do this. The key thing is, if I'm asking you for a, a deductive argument, you have to give a universal rule, one that applies to all cases of things that taste that don't go together, right? Now, if I ask you to, to provide me with an inductive argument, if I say, find an implicit premise that makes this into a strong argument, inductively strong argument, then you would want something like most tastes that don't go together when combined are disgusting, or usually when people put tastes together that, that don't match, it's disgusting. Usually, most, likely, probably, those are all inductive terms. And what you want to associate with inductive is strong, strong or weak, and then general rule, right? An implicit premise for a uh, inductive argument is probably going to be a general rule. For a deductive argument, valid, invalid, um, sound or unsound, whether the premises are true or not, and you're supplying a universal rule. <laughs> all, no, you know, something that applies across the board. A universal rule doesn't have any exceptions. So if we say all things whose tastes don't go together are disgusting, that's a universal rule. You're not leaving room for any exceptions. Um, does that help? 